Welcome everyone to tonight's event. So whether you are with us here in the Filene uh, Center or you are joining us online or you're watching this by video in the future, welcome. I'm Tori Holt. I'm the Norman E. McCulloch Jr. Director of the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding. We are one of your hosts here tonight. And I am delighted to introduce today's conversation, Vaccine Hesitancy and Misinformation, Sources and Solutions. We at the Dickey Center are dedicated to our founder's vision to address the great issues of the day, to see the world's problems as our problems, but also to consider what those of us here at Dartmouth and around the world can work to do together to address them. So one way to accomplish that is to have exactly this kind of conversation from leadership both here at Dartmouth and those we've brought to campus for today's conversation. You can't imagine an issue beyond the pandemic that has touched every human being that anyone here would know. And so I'm very excited about this conversation and to understand the collective response. Earlier last year, uh, our Director for Global Health and Development at the Dickey Center, uh, my colleague Don Carey, working with Dartmouth Professor Kendall Hoyt, came up with a brilliant new initiative called the Pandemic Security Project. The goal of this project is to convene Dartmouth, domestic, and international experts in economics, biosecurity, and epidemiology to study the global effects of pandemics, the origins of COVID, our preparedness, and to help suggest ways to prevent the next epidemic. So this is a second in a series of discussions and workshops on that topic. And I want to thank two of the Dickey Center's board members, Jennifer Wood and Tom Morrow, for their support for this project and tonight's event. So as I've noted, pandemics force us to really consider whether we have access to health care and vaccines, equity and trust in government, and to understand those links to climate change, our political systems, and development patterns. And what better way than an interdisciplinary discussion that we'll have tonight to look at applied research analysis and a way forward with policy options. So the question, I think, before the panel is what is the role in the fix for information hacking as an element of effective public health? Each of them will take a different perspective. I will briefly introduce them. They are all worth a long read because it's an unbelievable panel that we have to get to here tonight. Thomas Boyke is the director of the Global Health Program and senior fellow for Global Health Economics and Development at the Council on Foreign Relations and a charter member of our first work workshop this year. Brendan Nyan, known to many here, he is the James O. Friedman Presidential Professor in the Department of Government here at Dartmouth, who focuses among many subjects on misperceptions about politics and healthcare. Jillian Steele Fisher is a senior research scientist at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health, whose work is in understanding the public response to infectious disease outbreaks. Lindsay Leininger is a clinical professor of business administration at Tuck, an expert in public health policy and a faculty director of the new Tuck Center for Healthcare, as well as a co-sponsor of this event. Benjamin Chan is the New Hampshire State epidemiologist, infectious disease doctor, and an international health provider himself, as well as a 2013 graduate of TDI. And of course, Kendall Hoyt, associate, sorry, assistant professor of medicine at the Geisel School of That's Medicine, okay. senior lecturer <laughs> at the Thayer School of Engineering, and the faculty director of our pandemic security project. Before I turn to Kendall to say on logistics, if you're joining us online, put your questions in the Zoom function. We will take those up after the panel discussion. Kendall, over to you, and thank you. Thank you, Tori, for the promotion and the introduction. Um, so as you can see, we have an all-star cast here. I am so delighted that all of you could find time and find your way up here. This is delightful. I'm just going to say a few sentences to sort of frame the problem. Um, and you know, understand the sort of environment in which we're working in here. So taking the global perspective, um, UNICEF reported that um, due in part to large you know, COVID disruptions, a lot of low and middle income countries have witnessed the largest backslide in routine immunization in the last 30 years. Um, and we're already beginning to see some of the effects of this. You may have seen in the New York Times um, just this week, you know, there was a large measles outbreak in Zimbabwe, and 700 children have died, thousands more infected. Um, and, you know, COVID lockdowns, the diversion of healthcare resources, armed conflict in some places, and poor access have all contributed. 
But hesitancy and skepticism about the vaccines themselves are a large factor. And in fact, the WHO listed hesitancy as one of the top 10 health threats. Um, they did this in 2019 before the pandemic, and it, things we're seeing this play out. Um, so it's interesting to see what's been happening in the US, which had vaccines sooner than anyone else. And with the initial vaccine, we had incredible uptake. But that very quickly changed. And by 2021, um, the EU, um, you know, individual European nations in particular had much higher rates, but the EU collectively had higher rates than the US. And the Commonwealth Fund recently did a study that attributes that largely to hesitancy and skepticism. Now, there are other factors, you know, there are what we call vaccine deserts and political polarization, you know, different rates like Vermont, I think had 75%, Alabama had 47%, um, but it's, it's skepticism. And it's interesting, right? One would have thought that the arrival of a safe and effective COVID vaccine in the middle of a pandemic would have really heralded a golden era of vaccine acceptance. But really from the moment COVID-19 graced the scene, we've been subject to swiftly moving events with incomplete understanding. Um, fear and uncertainty unfurled within a fractious political environment. The digital universe reinforced and amplified this fear and division. Um, and complex decisions became binary pretty quickly, you know, to mask, to not mask, pro-vaccine, anti-vaccine. And nuance became very challenging in public discussion. Um, exhortations to follow the science were not straightforward because the, that's how science works. The evidence was evolving, it was changing, it was updating. Um, and this was met with impatience. You know, some felt like you know, the so-called experts didn't know what they were talking about or worse, were not acting in good faith you know, on behalf of public interest. And misinformation spread like wildfire through this social, political, and digital milieu. And then layered on top of that, we had actual disinformation campaigns. So there were enough honest and dishonest distortions that anyone could really be forgiven for experiencing some hesitancy before taking the vaccine, but not to the degree that maybe we saw. So to help us get to the bottom of all of this. Um, Jillian, I'm gonna turn this to you first. So you study public responses to health emergencies, and I know you're doing a lot of work with the CDC and state governments to understand the sources of hesitancy. Um, so what really, according to your research, are some of the biggest drivers, and what's the role of misinformation? Well, thank you so much um, for uh, inviting me here to talk about this really critical issue. Um, and, you know, I think something that you just spoke about actually speaks directly to my thinking about this. You said, you know, it, it sort of becomes a simplistic vision of what's happened, and there isn't a lot of room for nuance. So I'm going to interject with a little bit of nuance in here because people say, okay, you study the public opinion, you do lots of surveys, so what does the public think? I'm like, okay, which public? There's like a <laughs> lot of publics, as it turns out. And they're like, I know, it's so polarized. Which camp? I'm like, okay, let's go back to this. It's not just two camps either, okay? So let's think about this a little bit differently, and maybe this can be sort of an entree for this conversation, to think about not just two camps, not just where this is, but thinking about sort of a spectrum of behavior and that spectrum changing over time. So I promise not to share too much data, but I'm gonna sneak in a little bit of a slide right here. Okay, no one sees like, bring she the Harvard kid. She's like, hey, I gotta bring my data. Okay, so here's where it is. Here's just um, a little bit about sort of the, the actual behavior, and we think about this sort of just in this case from left to right. People on the left being fully vaccinated um, with uh, at least one booster and then, you know, more depending on their availability and um, eligibility. And then all the way at the right at folks who haven't had any vaccine at all. And to me, what's really interesting is when we think about misinformation and disinformation, right, the folks in that gray box are most vulnerable to it and most likely to share it. And people kind of on the other side are less likely to. We see that over time in the associations. So what I'm really interested in is sort of how porous is this kind of spectrum? Where does the misinformation and disinformation flow through this? And so I spend a lot of time thinking about this group, the folks who like 
kind of went on the path and then like, oops, stepped off. You're like, wait, what happened there? Like you were on board and what happened? And to your point, like, okay, right when the vaccine came out, there's so much demand, right? And then how does that wane over time? And what does that mean for sort of the future of hesitancy? And I try to think about, well, how can we understand the kind of collection of views and how they're related to mis and disinformation? And so I monitor a lot about trust in authoritative sources and trust in government. And so one measure, one way that we can kind of grapple with this is like, well, how many of these folks still trust government? How many of these folks are just like, mm, I'm in the anti-vax camp, right? What does that really look like? And what's interesting, I think it's an open question. You're like, okay, well, are all those people just, have they totally changed their mind? And a little bit of hope in here is that, mm, no. Actually, 69% of them say they trust the CDC a great deal or somewhat. And the remainders are those who are less trusting, right? And it's interesting because they really have a collection of views when you look at those groups um, separately. So we asked, like, what are their drivers of hesitancy? They're really different for those two groups. So let's look at that first group, the folks who trust. These are the top reasons why um, they have not gotten a booster. So they're eligible, right, but they haven't gotten it. Um, and you see that none of the reasons hold a majority share. So there's not a lot of sort of deep-rooted, collective views that are totally reinforced by the same group, right? Okay, so my top reason, I think the first vaccines are enough protection. Like a sort of a semi-reasonable kind of thought here, right? It's not, it's not wrapped up in sort of mistrust and concern and, and, and um, sort of misinformation. There's, there's some, you know, is it really enough? There's some questions around that. Um, some concern about long-term side effects. Um, and uh, some feeling I already had coronavirus, whether that's because it then gives people protection or because they're like, and it wasn't that bad, right? Just depending on how people's experience went. Um, and so when we think like, okay, these are collective reasons. When I look at the folks who are less trusting, now you notice all those reasons are up on the top. They're all at the bottom when you look at the folks who are less trusting, right? And all of a sudden I have reasons that are two thirds of people. Two thirds of people saying, I don't trust the government agencies that regulate vaccines anymore. 58%, I think boosters are promoted for political gain. Um, you know, about half saying uh, um, uh, they don't think they're very effective anymore. I'd rather get natural immunity, which is code for a lot of other, having a lot of other misinformation about the way vaccines really work. Um, and, uh, you know, again, worry about long-term side effects, but you can see there's huge differences there. And so what we want to think about as we try to think about the solutions is maybe we can have some of that nuance and the way we think about it and try to think about how we engage with people and think about the many publics that are out there and the kind of messaging, connection, messengers, and work that needs to be done to engage meaningfully with people around these issues depending on where they're starting from. Um, okay, well I have actually a follow-on question for you, but I think it makes more sense. I, I might go ahead to Tom because a year- You said I could share if I wanted. That's, what, that's it, with the microphone. I oh, could, yeah, right? yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I will, I will. I am super interested in what you say, so I will. <laughs> you can always grab it back. Okay, that's good to know. Be careful. Um, so, Tom, I think it'd be interesting to get you right on the heels of this, because you did a really fascinating study where you looked at this internationally, and you saw big, unexplained differences between rates in different countries. and they kind of upend some intuitions we might have about how a democratic government might be able to deal with this problem differently than say an autocratic government. So what did you find and like, how do you understand some of these differences that you saw? Great, uh, well first of all, let me thank Kendall and the organizers for having me up here. It's a really terrific panel. I'm pleased to be a part of it. It's always nice to be back in uh, Dartmouth, particularly this time of year. Um, so we actually did two studies, and I raised that because one is on this global question of what mattered for what we think may have mattered for everyone, and the second was looking really specifically at autocracies versus democracies, and in particular in that context, role of trust. Now, the pandemic obviously is not over. We're still learning a lot. Data is not great everywhere. But in global health policy circles, the race for pandemic preparedness has already begun. Uh, we're already raising funds to think about what we could do differently next time. Those funds are already being implemented, and that raises the issue of what should they be spent on? What have we learned from this pandemic that suggests we should either invest in the same sort of things we were investing in before or do things differently? And to answer that question, you really need to look at what has been 
referred to as the epidemiological mystery of this pandemic, which is why the pattern of outcomes, the burden, hasn't looked like uh, many other infectious disease challenges. And what I mean by that is many countries without a lot of resources or infrastructure appear to still have done reasonably well in the pandemic. Not all of them, but many of them. Uh, you see significant differences even within the same region. Neighboring countries will have a twofold difference in deaths and infections. Uh, so what explains this? And to look at that, we looked at the contextual factors, all the pet theories people have about what made a difference in this pandemic. So we look at pandemic preparedness metrics. We look at a variety of healthcare capacity metrics, you know, universal healthcare, number of hospital beds, numbers of physicians, government health spending. Um, we look at political factors. We look at populism. We look at democracy. Uh, we, we, we look at how states are organized, um, federal systems. We also look at economic factors, economic inequality, and social factors um, uh, as well. Uh, and when you come down to it, uh, most of that doesn't hold up. Most of those theories don't hold up. Uh, pandemic preparedness doesn't explain the differences, nor does difference in capacities or health spending or so forth. What really broke down globally, what mattered, was the trust you have in your government and the trust you have in one another. Uh, to a lesser extent, also government corruption, which we think may spur the lack of trust um, in, in those other factors. So that's what we found globally. And to tie quickly to the vaccines, you do see a pretty strong correlation between government trust, and this is for the nations that actually had supplies of vaccines to administer, you see a pretty strong correlation between trust and higher coverage rates. So that's the global study. It seems like trust, both interpersonal trust we have in one another, especially actually, and government mattered. So then we looked at this question of democracies and autocracies. And some of you may know there's a long standing theory back to Thomas Jefferson that, you know, despots and sick societies produce uh, disease and, and, and uh, sick people. And this notion that democracies uh, will do better in health because they're responsive to the people, uh, that they're accountable for health needs, um, that democracy should do better. And obviously, if you've been paying attention to this pandemic, that's not exactly what happened. Um, democracies haven't done worse. There's really no correlation. Uh, many autocracies have done poorly, many democracies have done poorly too. Uh, so we looked at this issue, of maybe trust matters more for democracies because they can't compel uh, protective behaviors, the adoption of protective behaviors. And this is the second study that Kendall uh, looked at. We had actually done a lot of research on democracy and health before. And what we found is it's really context specific. Uh, whatever Thomas Jefferson may think for a lot of endemic infectious diseases, actually autocracies do fine. There's not a strong relationship. If something can be addressed with a uh, targeted intervention, there's a lot of aid for it. Uh, you find that autocracies actually do as well as democracies. Where you see a big difference traditionally is on chronic illnesses, things that require system, iterative engagement, high quality health care, things of that nature. Um, in what it turns out is when you look at a emerging infection of a uh, novel disease for which there's no effective vaccine or treatment, the most effective thing a government can do to protect its citizens is to convince them to take the measures to protect themselves. Persuade. And that seems to matter more in free societies, democracies, and autocracies and you can see that in uh, the differences in infections that we've seen. We've seen a substantial difference between high countries that have high electoral democracy and high trust did significantly better than uh, their counterparts, autocracies that also report high levels of trust. So. Thank you. So, Brendan, I want to give you a chance to respond to some of what you've heard, but also you know, introduce some of your findings, too, which I think have been also upend a lot of, you know, intuitions. So they demonstrate that, like, a lot of 
common communication approaches have transient effects at best, like you know, fact checking. You know, and in fact, it can even have some unexpected and unintended and undesirable consequences. So I'd love to hear your reflections. Sure, um, thanks, it's great to be here. Uh, so I'll build directly on my fellow panelists in, in, in talking about uh, first, the, the heterogeneity of, of people's attitudes towards vaccines and their behaviors, and second, the role of, of trust. I think those are both really mm -hmm. important to thinking about why messaging mm -hmm. might or might not work. Mm -hmm. The intuition that often occurs among folks like many of the people in this room, I would guess, is that we can kind of science or fact check our way out of these problems, right? People have misunderstandings about vaccines, and if they only knew the facts, we could convince them. Um, but um, what I would encourage you to do instead is to, is to really think about the public um, in, in a more nuanced way, that most people aren't actually making decisions about almost anything in their lives along those lines, right? And, and, you know, and then people say, well, of course I do that, but everyone else doesn't. But I'm gonna say to you, no, no, actually you are relying on <laughs> trust too, right? When you're in the airplane, you're not studying the scientific, uh, you know, the, the classical physics of why airplanes can take off and fly in the air, right? You're trusting that the set of institutions that regulate air travel are um, assuring your safety when you get into that airplane, right? And vaccines work a similar kind of way. And the, 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 the most effective approach, I think, is a set of the kind of social consensus around a set of institutions, um, the combination of um, that social consensus and childhood vaccine mandates have been incredibly powerful. Um, we've seen challenges first to the childhood vaccine schedule and the uptake of those childhood vaccines, and then more recently with COVID. And there's been a question, well, what can we do? And then the, the search is, well, there's, there's, there must be some message out there that will convince people to mm -hmm get vaccines. And I don't want to say we can't message better. I think it's a it's an open empirical question what the most effective message is. But I think the starting point of our conversation should be um, about, uh, you know, we should question the assumption first that there is some magic message that will convince people to get vaccinated, right? And that the reason we're failing is because we haven't yet found this message that people will, you know, crumple before us on the floor and say, please, please put shots into my arm, right? There's no such message like that out there. Um, and in fact, I know, right? I wish it was out there too, right? Um, and uh, you know, so there's no message like that out there. Um, and in fact, a lot of the messages that are going to be effective, right? It's gonna matter a lot more who's delivering them than what we're saying, right? And in particular, focusing on the misperceptions that are out there may not be the most effective approach. That's the thing that I've studied most directly out of what we've spoken about thus far. Um, when we've shown people corrective information, saying that this thing you might've heard about vaccines um, isn't true or isn't supported by science, um, we found that that's often ineffective or even counterproductive. And we found that counterproductive result, at least in terms of people's intention to vaccinate a future child or to get a vaccine in the future themselves, among the people who are already hesitant to begin with. Um, and you know, it's important to, to differentiate here when you hear that result. You may think, well, that's the anti-vaccine people, they won't listen to anyone. But really, when you do any kind of a study like what I'm describing, there's so few truly hardcore anti-vaccine people, there's almost none of them in our samples. The people who are consistently against every aspect of vaccines are a tiny percentage of our society. It's really more the 25, 30, 35% of folks who express misgivings about mm -hmm. vaccines in surveys even before COVID, mm -hmm. right? Um, those folks, we need to think about how to reach them through people that they trust, right? I don't think we're going to fix social trust. I don't have any way to make people start trusting the government right now. And in fact, we can talk about how actionable those kinds of things are, right? Like, I like, you know, Denmark has many advantages being a small homogenous country, but we are not Denmark, right? So we have to think about who are the people in people in, in folks, social networks and communities that they trust? Who are the healthcare providers that they trust? Right? Who are the religious leaders and education leaders and business leaders they trust? And mobilize them. I think that could be a more effective approach um, than a, a science-focused message. Okay. So, thank you. And I'm coming back to that. Um, so, Ben, how does this square with your experience in New Hampshire? And what are you seeing? And, and what, what do you think the sources are? And what's been effective in your point of view? Yeah. And... Um, so, so for those who, who maybe um, aren't aware, I, I, uh, one of my roles um, in state government as state epidemiologist has been um, from uh, has been the role of, of one of the primary public health communicators, uh, pretty much to everybody 
right, throughout the state, healthcare providers, schools, the general public. And so, um, as opposed to my, my colleagues uh, who have referenced um, a lot of studies um, that have been conducted or are currently being conducted, I, I guess my comments are coming more from um, the uh, experiential perspective of what does this look like having played out during, during the pandemic. Um, and I, I think I'm gonna agree with a lot of what um, my fellow panelists have said. A lot of this comes down to issues of trust and credibility and whether people have trust in the messenger, uh, who, the people that are providing the recommendations and whether that person has credibility. Um, but if you take a step back, even, even take a step back from the vaccine issue to trust and credibility in general, I, I think there are a number of factors during this pandemic which have impacted people's perception or trust in government, trust in public health agencies. Um, and, and I don't think it's, I don't think there's one simple answer, right? It's, it's, it's heterogeneous. Just like the public response, um, when you take a survey, there's multiple different groups of people, they have different responses. The reasons behind that, I think, are, are multifactorial. And a lot of it comes down to issues of communication, misinformation, disinformation, which is, I think, one of the primary topics that we're here to talk about tonight. But I, I think it actually goes beyond that um, to issues of, you know, you, you've heard the phrase, well, people just don't trust science anymore. You know, and I, that's been, I think, talked about in the media. Um, and I, I, think, I think we need to tease that apart, right? Because I don't think the central issue here is one of lack of trust in science. Um, there's the scientific process, um, but then there's also how we implement that science. And I'm gonna come back to this question of implementation and, and implementation science, because I think one of the things that um, has impacted trust and credibility is the fact that you had the federal government, you had state government, you had local public health jurisdictions, everybody was looking at the same science, right? But we were all implementing that in a different way. And by implementation, I'm talking about stuff like guidance and recommendations that were coming out, um, messaging, in, in this case, maybe around vaccines, uh, COVID-19 mitigation measures, um, you know, how, how the different people were engaged and you know, delivered healthcare services like vaccines. The, the, the way that the US is set up, and this gets back to the issue of like, you can't necessarily extrapolate findings from a more homogenous country to the US. The way the US government is set up is, is as you know, federalist states. We all, you know, state, states have local jurisdiction and control over many of these issues. Um, and so what you saw during the pandemic were uh, state and local public health agencies all implementing the same science in various uh, different ways, and that led to a lot of comparisons, you know, between states. People not knowing, well, who's right? How? What are the recommendations we're supposed to follow? Should we follow CDC's recommendations? Should we follow New Hampshire's recommendations, which might be a little bit different? Why do those differ from Vermont's recommendations or Massachusetts' recommendations? Um, and I think that implementation of the science contributed to confusion uh, and um, really. A, lack of, you know, led to distrust and credibility issues from the people that were trying to protect population health. And then you get to the communication issues of like, how, how is that guidance? How are those recommendations being communicated? Who's doing the communication? Um, who's the target audience? How is that, how are those recommendations being communicated? Um, you know, communication itself is a, is a whole issue. So, you know, you have the science and how people are not only conducting science, but synthesizing the science. Um, you know, the fact that the science is changing over time, over the course of the pandemic, like we can't change that. You know, new variants emerge, vaccine efficacy, you know, changes with, you know, genetic mutations in the virus. But, but I think a lot of the issues actually come back to um, issues of implementation science, um, how the science was applied to different communities. And then, um, you know, and, and then there are the issues of communication um, and different people saying different things, the, politis, uh, the politicization of um, public health, you know, politicians saying um, stuff that wasn't necessarily backed by science, even, you know, scientists saying stuff that was, you know, politicized, right? It, it got to be a, 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 a mess, mm -hmm. um, to, be, to be frank. And I think that led to what you're seeing in the studies of um, different people not knowing who to trust um, and being unsure of what we sometimes refer to as the science 
but really it, becomes, it comes down to issues of not just the science but, and the changing science, but issues of implementation of that science and then communication um, and outreach to the various people that needed to be, that needed to hear that message. And in something like a pandemic, it, communication becomes difficult because who's your audience, who's your target audience? It's everybody. Um, but the way you communicate and the message um, and the pathway of communication is different depending on the different audiences. Yeah, no, what you're describing is extremely difficult and it gets at the heart of our federalized system, right? What works in Massachusetts is not gonna work in Arkansas and you wanna allow that and yet <laughs> you want it to um, be implemented in a way that serves public health. And so it's, you know, it's a good and bad. There's two sides to that coin. Um, it's a very tricky thing that we haven't mastered. Um, so Lindsay, uh, we are all subject to competing claims and tricky risk calculations because I mean, what help? What help were these guys, right? <laughs> Can I, no, if they were a great help. Um, <laughs> but we have personalized questions, right? Can my unvaccinated children go visit my vaccinated mother, you know? And how do we, you have to make these bizarre risk calculations without enough data really to do it rationally all the time. So, you know, and, and you noticed you were getting pummeled with these questions. So how did you choose to navigate that for more than just yourself? Well, thank you. It is such a treat to be on this panel with these amazing experts. So thanks for putting it together and including me. Um, I am not an August expert or a uh, lead policy maker. I am a humble, nerdy girl. Let me tell you what that means in the context of this panel. So when COVID hit, and really, let's, let's say March, so, so it had been a couple places, I got really confused by the data that was coming out of the WHO, the Diamond Princess. Anyone remember the Diamond Princess? Yeah, yeah right? Natural experiment. Whew. Um, I started posting about the data on my Facebook page, quickly found a bunch of other women scientist friends. We joined together. We started a Dear Abby-like page called Dear Pandemic. <laughs> it went viral. Now we are a pro-science social media platform. We speak to about 200,000 regular readers, and every day we have a question box that gets a lot of questions along the lines of, can I go see my grandmother on Wednesday after soccer practice, but before the nursing home? But should we share a meal or straws or not, right? <laughs> um, so first, it's never about the question. And always, whether I'm doing this one-on-one -on -one with you know Uncle Brendan, who's nervous about getting his booster shot, or whether or not <laughs> I'm answering you know about Don's kid's soccer practice, it's never about the information. It's about the psychological undercurrent. Feelings first. That's my mantra. Feelings first. Wow, I know this is frustrating. You have a lot on your shoulders. This is a hard decision to make. I get it. It is so hard. You want to see your family. Trust your compass. Let's talk about what is, matters most to you. So it's always feelings first. People don't want data. This is, comes back to Brendan's point. They want to know that they're listened to. I want data, right? I'm a PhD. I want data. But people first want to be heard. Then there will likely be an opportunity to give a piece of data. Like, you know what, Uncle Brendan? I don't trust institutions either. I'm a native Texan. I trust myself. Like you, I'm a critical thinker. That's great, right? I'll tell you what I do trust, scientific method. And I spent a long time in school studying the scientific method. As you know, you gave me lots of ribbing for spending all that time at those universities out east. And I think that the science, I'm convinced for me the best choice is to get vaccinated. But let's keep talking about it. And if there's ever an opportunity, that might change your mind, I'm here. Now let's go watch some football, right? So, so it's really about connection, protecting the relationship, getting to the psychological undercurrent, and when the opportunity presents, then you can throw in some data. But prioritizing connection, I think, is key. 
And Brendan made this point earlier. I think mobilizing armies of communicating communicators, community-based communicators about vaccines, about pandemics, whatever it is, I think it's our only hope, truly. I, I do, because no matter how wonderful your communication is from the government, there are people in New Hampshire who just are never gonna believe you, right? So we need to find them a nerdy girl. We need to find them an imam. We need to find them somebody who they will trust. And that person, we need to look to you and align to you, which we did. <laughs> um, so that that's a little windy, but I'm, you know, I think it's the power of personal connection really is what I lean on most. So, I mean, taken together, like these comments sort of raise two questions for me. I mean, one is if it, is it really our only hope? Like, and if so, how do you scale that approach, really? And are we really saying that, like, we can't rely on the CDC? I mean, what is the role of government? What can government do? And, and what, what is the role of Facebook? You know, like, removing posts, you know, like, what, you know, it, it, it's all fine and well to have, you know, an educated um, cousin at Thanksgiving, you know, who's very empathetic. But like, really, we need to start to scale some plans. So um, I guess I would turn it first to you and say, how do you, how do you scale Nerdy Girl? How do you make that into um, a public health communication agenda and strategy? Yeah, so I am thinking a lot about this. So the World Health Organization came to us and said, will you write a field guide, a playbook for nerdy girls for future health emergencies? So as I'm thinking about this, I, I think of two things. And the one is technology. All the bad things that technology does amplifying bad information. It also connects trusted people with each other in a heartbeat. So we operated a whole campaign from a Slack workspace such a thing didn't exist when I helped run an ACA navigator training campaign back for the Affordable Care Act. Very clunky, like Reddit-like listserv back then. So the communication tools are much better and they scale really quickly. Um, also, another group out of Chicago that's done amazing place-baked work. They have launched an entire metropolitan, really amazing community ed education effort by staying in touch with with each other via Twitter amplifier. So I think technology is a big piece of this. I also think technical assistance is a big piece of this. Any teacher knows a good curriculum matters. So the behavioral scientists, for example, put together a document for communicators in a Google Doc, living document saying, go do this, say that. People like me, I'm not a behavioral scientist, but I had that technical assistance. I had this live curricula that I could work towards. So that's what I think when I think of scale. I think of connecting communicators with each other and with good evidence. Um, and I think we saw a lot of hope with that in the pandemic, even though technology also did horrible things um, on the other side. Oh, everybody, okay. It, Brendan, well, you can fight over the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Go, yeah. Hua, hua. Um, so what I would say is if we have the right incentives, those communication efforts will arise. Like, so let's take the example of the Affordable Care Act we were just talking about, right? Because of the Supreme Court decision, the Medicaid expansion wasn't nationwide. So what do we do instead? We said, we'll drive a dump truck full of money up to your state if you only expand Medicaid, we will, spend, we will, we will fund 90% of the cost, right? And people figured out how to navigate the politics in most of the states, not all of them, but they got through, it through a lot of states. They figured out how to separate it from some of the national politics. They worked these kinds of issues. They found mm -hmm. trusted communicators. They phrased it in terms of locally relevant values and messages. Mm -hmm. It was really effective. If you look at some of those success stories, they're quite remarkable. I think we could do the same thing on vaccines and, and uh, you know, some of our past successes have that flavor. We're just now having to fight the threat of politicization too. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's gonna be really important to move quickly before this issue gets mapped in a more fundamental way to the national partisan divide, which is something I'm really worried about. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm thinking about scale a lot. Um, I think we all are, we're like, oh, where are the threads, the good threads and how do we make that, how do we knit that into something bigger? Um, and I think, for me, I also want to think about not just sort of, okay, can we seed a whole new communication network, but think about what already exists. So the data suggests that people really trust their doctors. Turns out that not everyone trusts me. Like, I have a very particular profile, right? So people aren't like, tell me, PhD from Harvard, 
what should I do? I'd love it. I mean, I'd love it if my children did that too. But it turns out there's lots of people. I need to find my connection. And sometimes Uncle Brent and I will like have that connection, but sometimes we just don't. So I need to have more diversity around the people who can be communicators so they reflect the communities that we're talking about and the people we're talking about and shared values. And I don't have the Texas connection. I can't work that. Oh, it's a really good one. Um, <laughs> and so I think if we think about the healthcare system that we do have, we know that trusted doctors are so important. And not everyone has a doctor. Everyone's like, well, what do we do about the people that don't have a doctor? Like, okay, we'll get there. But a lot of people do have a relationship with a doctor. And over and over again, we see that those conversations matter. And that's a, you know, a system that we have some access to, I hope. I'm looking at you like with this like hope in my eyes, like tell me there's some connection. I know, I know. There's definitely some skepticism, but I think that's a really good place to begin to have those conversations because it exists. It doesn't require like just growing from the base. And it doesn't mean that we shouldn't also do that. Um, I love the sort of like truck full of money approach. I'd love to spend more money on this. I don't know where the bounds of that will be. Um, but you know, we've got to try a lot of different things. Um, and so thinking about wh the ways that doctors can be that, and I see you're turning your microphone on, so let's tell me, tell me what, it, what you think, if that's on, on track or not. Well, so, so um, I, I want to build a little bit off of what Uncle Brendan said. Okay. You're never going to live that down. You're gonna be <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I think, well, well, build off what you said in terms of, you know, I think this is an, uh, what you said is an argument for two things. Um, one is that, uh, and I'm going to plug public health here, right? One is for a strong state or local or both public health agency, right? Because communication has to be local, right? That's where you build up the, the trust and the credibility. And, and during a pandemic, um, when even providers don't know what's going on, right? The, the, one of the first sources of information and communication of scientifically relevant information should be coming from the public health agency, yeah. right? And so in, in New Hampshire, we, we have, we're a centralized public health structure. Um, we're a small public health agency. Um, but I think the fact that we are centralized allows us to leverage that central communication um, more effectively than someplace that has different messages coming from multiple different, different places, right? So one, you know, strong public health agency can go far in having that sort of centralized, trusted, um, you know, source of communication. Two, um, speaking to the politics, I, I think that um, there's a need for, um, and I think New Hampshire did this very well. Um, I didn't see this happen as well in other places, making sure that um, government leadership, political leadership, was on the same page with what public health was saying. Um, and, and I think that we went, so, so public health is part of the executive branch of government um, for those who aren't aware that you know the same thing happens at the federal level, right? CDC is part of the you know answers to the executive branch of government, um, and so making sure that um, the public health message and the political communication are on the same page, I think, is really important because when it's not, that's where you get you know the differing messages coming out, people not not being sure of whether you trust the the communication from you know, the, the political leadership or other state leadership versus a public health agency. And when everybody's on the same page um, and is in agreement with what the message is, um, that helps build the local trust and credibility and communication, right? So strong public health agency, making sure that, you know, public health agencies, scientific, you know, communicators, you know, government leadership are all on the same page. And I think New Hampshire has done relatively well in that regard throughout the pandemic. Um, and then the third point I wanted to make, I don't mean to go on too long here, is that I, I think it is really important, uh, and I don't think I said this as clearly during my introductory remarks, it's very important, I think, to identify who your target audience is. Because what you communicate, the message, and how you communicate it, um, and the, mode, the, the method of outreach is gonna be very different. Um, and, and this is an area that I think um, public health uh, can do better at. We, we do very, um, we have a lot of experience with communication to some of our traditional partners, our healthcare providers, for example. And oftentimes we'll go to our healthcare providers relying on them to then relay it to the patient because of the issue of, you know, oftentimes the healthcare provider is one of the more trusted entities for patients. So we have very strong outreach mechanisms and communication mechanisms to providers. We, we built up additional lines of communication to different agencies, long-term care facilities, schools um, during, during the pandemic 
Um, and there were significant efforts at p general public outreach and communication. But that's one of these areas, going back to your, your point, that you know, there's, there, there, there needs to be um, more capacity and more expertise and more people um, to do the, the type of public outreach and communication that's needed um, during something like a pandemic. And oftentimes we still rely on traditional modes of media, you know, news, print media, um, for trying to communicate with the public, you know, press conferences, TV, when a large proportion of the population is disseminate, is uh, ingesting information through social media, for example, or, or other forms. And so our outreach needs to align with the way that our, tar uh, our target audience is receiving um, and, you know, digesting the information coming to them. Tom. So, um, this one. Great. Uh, so this is such a rich conversation. Um, I want to talk about uh, moving from the local level to the global level. Um, because we also were approached by WHO, which I'm starting to feel like wasn't so unique. Um, <laughs> but they, absolutely. And they, they're trying to come up with metrics. You know, we've had this pandemic none of our pandemic preparedness metrics worked. How do we actually measure what people do moving forward? What's going to be effective? Um, you know, you did this study around trust. Other people have done studies around trust. We're not unique in that regard. Uh, globally, uh, what, how is this actually implementable? Um, so we recommended three things, and I think it's worth, because they, a lot of the conversation we have kind of fits into them. Uh, the first is this notion of trusted messenger, community specific. There's actually a long tradition of that globally. Um, so whether it's the West Africa Ebola epidemic and the strategies used to turn that around, um, or the CDC's plans, uh, influenza uh, pandemic plan book, which had community specific strategies of what states should be doing to engage members of specific communities around engagement on vaccination. There's a whole National Academy of Sciences study on this. There's, these things were in place. We just simply didn't use them. So how do you draw from Uncle Brendan uh, <laughs> community specifically? Because it's not just how you communicate. It's being able to draw from that specific community. And here I want to draw out something Brendan had said, because I think it's a really important point, his point about planes and how we trust the government to before we get on a plane, or we trust the government to buy medicines from a pharmacy. And I think there's something different we're asking around vaccination and in a pandemic, where we're persuading. And to persuade, you need members from those communities. You need people that, that trust that community specific, specific understanding of concerns to really do that persuasion. So that's the first one. Uh, is to be trustworthy by having those trusted messengers and community-specific messages. The second issue is to trust. You know, how do you communicate to people? And it's about being transparent about the trade-offs, your concerns, what we know, what we don't know. And that's something we've really struggled with in the United States in this pandemic. Being clear, here's why I'm concerned with recommending masks for everyone at this moment in the pandemic. Um, or here's what I'm thinking about in terms of drawing the eligibility requirements for the vaccine at this point. Uh, we have not always been clear about what it is that we're thinking, what the overall strategy is, what the trade-offs are. We have to trust our audience because if you're not telling them things, they sense it and they don't trust you either. So that trust goes both ways. The third issue is uh, trust erodes in a pandemic. If you look at trust surveys globally that have occurred in government, they've gone down everywhere except, interestingly, in the federal government in the United States. The reason for that, trust is partisan in the United States. So you had a shift around the election where Democrats now trust the federal government more than they trusted it before because of the switch, and you see Republicans trust the federal government less than they trusted it before. But the point that Jillian made about it being specific to agencies and is 100% right. Nobody thinks of just the government, they think of their health agency, they think at the state level. And you know, thinking about how we can make it easier for people to slow down that erosion in trust is really important. And there I think about uh, investments that encourage pro-social behaviors like paid sick leave, paid family leave, 
that make it easier for people to comply, less burdensome, so they don't resent more the advice and things they're being asked to do. I'm going to ask you all a question. So there are carrots. Trust is very nice. And there are sticks. And there are vaccine mandates. And there's evidence that vaccine uptake improves when there are mandates, right? So, and, but challenges are mounting in the courts. I mean, every state house has all of these bills right now challenging you know, the extent of that power to issue mandates. Um, and it's not just about employers. It's also about you know, childhood vaccine requirements as well. And that's, so I'm wondering how, and Ben, I know you're deeply involved in some of this too. I'm wondering how you all think about that as a strategy, and also just forward looking, how do we think this is going to shake out in the courts? What's going to be the impact? And I'll let you start, Ben. But you know, yes, I'm, since you since you threw up my name there yeah, first, yeah. Maybe, maybe I'll start. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I think a lot of the um, so so first off, like population wide vaccine mandates are unusual. I mean, put it that way. You know, a, a lot of the places where we see mandates historically being implemented, and, and currently, you know, healthcare system, for example, mm -hmm. right? A lot of data coming from the healthcare system, which requires vaccines of their employees to protect their employees, but also to protect their vulnerable patient population. Um, a, a, lot, a lot of that data sh shows that um, to get to the really high levels of vaccination in healthcare providers, uh, to, you know, over, you know, 90, over 95%, you, you, you need, it requires a mandate to do that oftentimes. Mm -hmm. Uh, or it's the mandate that pushes that vaccination level to the highest level possible. Mm -hmm. um, on sort of the, 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 the other end, more the, what's maybe more within um, public health's purview um, is that m many, uh, many or all, I, I don't know about the you know, percentage here, but many or, or if not most states have um, vaccine requirements of some form for entry into childcare or schools. Mm -hmm. um, and, and at least in New Hampshire, um, this is part of uh, public health's authority is being able to go through a, a process which, in, which um, involves the commissioner of health and the, the legislature um, to get certain vaccines listed um, as required before a child can go into child care or K through 12 school. Um, and, you know, there, there are something, I think it's something like 17 or 18 childhood vaccines um, that are currently recommended by um, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, ACIP, which is the group, the Medical Science Advisory Group that comes out with vaccine recommendations and vaccine schedules. There's something like 17 or 18 uh, childhood vaccines that are currently recommended. Um, and 10 of those um, uh, are required, are on the required list for entry into child care or K through 12 schools um, in New Hampshire. And so it's not all vaccines, uh, but it's, it's a certain list of vaccines um, that are listed as required. And there are like medical and religious exemptions that um, a parent or a guardian can go through. Um, but those um, requirements have been there for years or decades. Um, they involve um, diseases that uh, are reportable to public health. There's a public health intervention um, if somebody comes down with one of these diseases like polio or measles, uh, there's the potential for large scale outbreaks in settings like school and child care agencies. Um, and these are highly effective, durable vaccines um, that are sort of focused on for inclusion in this list of required um, vaccines. And those requirements have helped push New Hampshire and, you know, childhood vaccination rates in New Hampshire to some of the highest levels in the country, right? So, so there, there is, there is a, a role for, um, you know, vaccination requirements. There's a process that we go through to have those listed or delisted, um, but requiring population-wide vaccines um, like we heard talked about during the pandemic is unusual. Right, right. So, but it's more like they're, you know, people are beginning to challenge in the courts the idea that in order to work here, you have to be vaccinated. I mean, on this level, I think this is going to start to have an impact. Yeah. I was just going to quickly yeah. weigh in on the legal issue. Yeah, yeah. And the reason why yeah. is Brendan made this great point before about um, the need to move before public health or vaccines in particular become the next polarized issue in the United States. 
you're actually seeing this happen, this issue of public health regulations becoming a victim of a broader legal yeah. trend in the courts. Yeah. And it's in two areas. One is the major questions doctrine, which is a pushback on the Chevron doctrine in courts about giving deference to agencies to make the decisions. The second is a very expansive interpretation of the right of free exercise. And what's happening is pandemic regulations are becoming seen as less extraordinary. And they are becoming part of this broader legal trend about uh, curbing back uh, deference to agencies on the issue of CDC with, for instance, a mass or OSHA implementing uh, vaccine mandates or in terms of pandemic restrictions on religious gatherings and churches, having a very expansive notion, expansive in my view, notion of the right of free exercise for what some might have considered traditionally being a neutral, generally mm -hmm. applicable regulation. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, this is now folding into a broader trend that's not specific to public health, mm -hmm. but public health is no longer being exempted from it and certainly not in this pandemic. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, vaccines have always been a lightning rod for the essential question of individual rights versus you know, curbing those rights for the purpose of the broader good, which has always been at tension you know, from the beginning of vaccines, but. That's know. the heart of public health law, right there. The yeah. issue of individual yeah. rights versus collective interests is Right, is the and we make those trade-offs all the time, you know, in society, but I feel like this is, it's interesting that it's part of a broader legal trend that feels like part of a broader cultural trend that is particularly at a time, though, when the stakes are high, right? And Brendan, your research really indicates that I mean, you're kind of a strict behavioralist, right? Like, information isn't going to get the job done, so. Yeah, no, I, I would, uh, I would run to, uh, you know, to this to incentives, too. So, uh, you know, I would encourage us to not get locked into a universal mandate or going nothing. to incentivize you with this stick? Right, well, <laughs> it's a kind of incentive, right? So, you know, um, healthcare, well, you know, if, in a world where the courts weren't precluding employer mandates, that's a kind mm -hmm. of incentive, right? Um, nursing home visitation, right? Mm -hmm. Do they have the right to require vaccination of folks who come mm -hmm. in there, et cetera, right? Like there's lots of de relatively decentralized ways if the courts allow them that one could create different sorts of incentives. And uh, there obviously may be carrots too mm -hmm. um, out there, right? Um, you know, again, maybe it's just a matter of incentivizing the healthcare system to reach out to people. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think it's important to, to just be really clear about what, what you just heard, that mm -hmm. the only way to get to very high levels of vaccination is mandates. Like the history mm -hmm. of human society tells us this, like mm -hmm. full stop, mm -hmm. right? So um, if we think the, the, the world we wanna reach is that high level of, of, of vaccination, then we would have to go down this road. And then there's a society-wide conversation about values. It's not a conversation about science, mm -hmm. ultimately, right? Mm -hmm. It should be informed by science, of course, mm -hmm. right? But that's a, that's a conversation uh, uh, about values. Um, and I just, uh, I, I worry that, again, sometimes people are just thinking, well, uh, you know, once we find this magical message, right, like we'll get these numbers up. These numbers are likely to continue, right? Our, our policy status quo, if anything, is a kind of deteriorating level of focus, effort, funding, resources, et cetera, right? Now, maybe you can tell a story where a kind of depoliticization happens over time, but I'm not certain that that takes place, right? I mean, you know, I, I guess I would just say, like, I think we're at, we're at this kind of fork in the road moment, and I can kind of, let me sketch out for two scenarios for one second. Um, one is a kind of process of depoliticizing the mm -hmm. vaccine as much as possible, mm -hmm. um, bringing it out of the sphere of partisan conflict, making it part of everyday life, and creating these kinds of incentives for uptake, right, mm -hmm. on the one hand. And, like, in the process of doing that, we get to a world where different kinds of mandates are, are politically possible because we've built some social consensus around it, at least in certain mm -hmm. spheres of life, mm -hmm. right? The other one is this kind of um, broader uh, trend towards politicization of vaccines, which we haven't seen before. It's really important to be clear about this. There's no evidence of a strong partisan divide in the prior public opinion on vaccines. But we're now at the case, we're now at the point rather, where one of the strongest predictors of not being vaccinated is your, part, is your partisan affiliation. And that wasn't true before, right? Now, if that spills over to childhood vaccines, or that becomes more entrenched in partisan identities, we've got a real problem, right? Because measles doesn't care what party, um, you know, the parent is, right? Um, so I, I, I worry that, that that's the other road we mm -hmm. could head down. And I guess, 
even though I'm, I'm making these points about the importance of incentives, mm -hmm. I do worry that ill-conceived efforts in that direction could fuel the partisan fire. Yeah. And, and there's a real potential for backlash there. Yeah, no, I, it's very well put. Um, unless you have burning follow-ons, I think we'd love to hear any questions from the audience. Yes, and we can, oh. yeah, we're gonna. Um, one of the factors that I haven't heard people, I'm sorry, artist Olson, pediatrician um, working on HPV vaccination hesitancy. Um, one of the factors you haven't talked about is how the effectiveness of our vaccine is morphing out from under us. You know, how many boosters, whatever. I mean, that does a huge hit on trust in vaccines. You, I got vaccinated, I got COVID anyway. Why should I vaccinate my child, et cetera? Have you, you want to discuss that? Yeah, if I, if I can start here since I have the microphone. Um, yeah, so, so I, I think this, this goes back to, um, well, I think there's multiple issues entwined in that. One is, is the issue of science and, and the fact that science is changing. You know, our, our knowledge and understanding of um, the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the COVID-19 virus is changing as it mutates and as it evolves. And that's in its impact on the vaccines you know, is changing as well. And so what we've seen is that the, the vaccines had very high, you know, vaccine effectiveness um, for the first, you know, six plus months, six, eight, even 10 months after the vaccines rolled out. And then when the Delta variant emerged and then the Omicron variant emerged, vaccine effectiveness started to decrease. And when Omicron hit, it started to decrease dramatically. And so, you know, that, that, that gets very complicated from a um, public messaging and public trust standpoint when the vaccines were great and now they're, uh, well, they're, you know, getting, getting less effective. Now you need a booster. Oh, and we're finding a second booster helps as well. Um, and so I, I think um, part of this is just the nature of a pandemic and the evolving science um, around the pandemic. But there absolutely is a component of um, both how um, this gets messaged um, and how the vaccines get rolled out, right? And so, as an example, the most recent um, bivalent Omicron boosters that got, that got rolled out um, could have been done, I think, in a, um, from a federal perspective in, in a smoother process, right? We've been talking at a state level about the need for an updated booster shot, likely for everybody, Going back to going back eight months, like I, we on some of our healthcare provider webinars we've been doing, I, I looked back on the PowerPoint slides, going back to like February of this year, we were talking about the need for an updated um, booster, for maybe for everybody that's coming fall winter, you know, eight months ago, um, and yet we only had details of um, the the federal plan for rolling rolling out these boosters two weeks before it happened. Right, and so there's a large gap of time there where there could have been some anticipatory messaging, expectation setting, um, planning. Um, e e even if maybe the plans changed, um, there, there, there could have been, I think, uh, more forewarning that these were coming and messaging to um, set expectations um, and to let people know at a, at a federal level that, that this was happening. We're trying to do that at a local level, but you know, it, it's hard to cut through some of the, the federal um, the national dialogue, and it's, it's not just the, the federal government, it's you know, just the national dialogue that's, that's happening. And so the, the way some of these, um, these vaccines have been rolled out and communicated, um, there's, there's room for improvement, I think is my point. Um, but certainly the, the changing science of this has made it difficult. Oh. Um, oh, 10 second point. Even the term vaccine effectiveness is really difficult, right? Because, of course, they're still protecting at a very high level against severe illness and death. But, and I'm not, I don't mean to pick on you, like that's a term of art, right? But that's an example of we've set ourselves up with this benchmark of sterilizing immunity or they're a failure, right? When remember, we, the CDC was looking for 50% vaccine effectiveness at the beginning of this. We got 90, 95, and that became the public benchmark. And ever since, we've been, um, you know, trying to convince people that these are still great vaccines. And they really are. I get at preventing severe illness and death. Mm -hmm. But that message when people don't feel vulnerable to severe illness and death given their particular circumstances doesn't seem to be working as well. Yeah, yeah I, wanna, I wanna pass to our, our communicator. Oh, goodness, I don't know about that. But I, I, think, I think there's messaging around the boosters and then I think there's just pandemic fatigue. 
I think people are just done. And when I looked at Jillian's data and like people can justify this, I had COVID, I had one shot. They're just done. And then, you know, Tom talked about chronic disease and how that's a different ball game. When you're being asked to get boosters every six months, that's more like a chronic disease sort of model of care, right? So I think I'm not even sure this is that misinformation is like the biggest issue we're fighting with this. I, I actually think these are the good old fashioned issues that like I think about as a Medicaid researcher, which is my background of like medical compliance, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> On, on the way over, can I just also add quickly <laughs> oh, that, you, bet. Hi, you know, Jack. this is, this is where some, <laughs> I'm sorry, on the, this is where some anticipatory messaging can be really helpful that like, we're not, we're not planning on vaccinating people with these vaccines every six months. I think that's people's perception. Totally. Um, but that's not, that's not realistic. And that's not the expe ex expectation of how we think this is going to go. And so people want to know, well, what's, what's this going to be like going forward? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's important that it's like, it's, it's not like, well, now we're in the pandemic. Now we know what's going on. This whole dialogue is continuing to happen. We still don't know. It's still evolving. And I do think the issues about understanding a different nuance around effectiveness is really important because people's understanding of what effectiveness means, it's really hard to explain to someone. Um, like, yeah, this will keep you out of the hospital, but you'll still get it and give it to grandma. Like, wait, what? Like people were doing this in part because they wanted to protect their grandparents. The issue of transmission is not as clear. Like these are really important issues that we deal with. And I think that we're, we're not really forthcoming about that from the get-go. Can I just reinforce everything you just said? That makes it so difficult. And then we're like back on our heels. And then people are like, see? Right? And that is really, really hard because now it brings up the issues around um, you know, the, the sort of good old fashioned issues around hesitancy, which is like not sort of, you know, the sort of very extreme anti-vax sentiment that might be totally disengaged from science. I think, you know, there's this dialogue that happens as like, well, there's a problem with people's belief in science. But if you ask the people who are not maybe in favor of getting a booster at the moment, they're not like, oh, I don't believe in science. That's why. I mean, that's not what's happening at all. They're like, no, I've got science. It's just that like I had COVID and it wasn't that bad. And like the vaccine isn't gonna protect my grandma. So like, why am I bothering to go? And what people are missing is a motivation to go. And that's what we see. Like, you know, when we look at the reasons, right? It wasn't like 86% of people don't wanna get it because of this reason. It's just not entrenched. It's just, there's no deriving reason to go. And in part, because people are done. And because they actually have to worry about other things and their kids have to go back to school. And that's really important, you know? And, and so I think in the public health community, when we don't acknowledge that and sort of, like when we actually have feelings first from a, like an institutional level, we also get into trouble. Where we just keep at an institutional level sort of be like, this is the data on effectiveness. Like it just doesn't, it just doesn't go. It's like, you know, and, and we see when we ask people like how effective is something. So like the headlines in New York Times were like 95% effective, 90% effectiveness. Okay, it's like 40% of people who said it was very effective. Like what? So the, the, the public conception of what effective means is really different. And we have to acknowledge that and kind of put that forward in everything we're doing. Did you tell I, I just want yeah. to add two cents. I mean, it's not just the public that politicized the vaccine. Both administrations really uh, tied their political fortune around these vaccines. Uh, it is not a surprise to many people, uh, particularly in, in Washington policy circles or around uh, that were involved in the early uh, days around the setup of Operation Warp Speed and what it would do. There were many people who did not think this would offer sterilizing immunity or be able to achieve herd immunity. That was never really conveyed to the public. It is not a surprise that that is the outcome. Um, and that really ties to both parties. And even now, I think the pandemic, it's not just that the people are sick of it, it's become a political liability. And we don't have a lot of clear messaging coming out on the federal level. Um, people want uh, the, the public to turn the page and believe the pandemic is over. And that's, of course, also affecting the appetite to take boosters or other things. And I think we have to acknowledge this isn't just a ground up phenomenon that this was fed into um, at, at the political level as well. Yeah, thank you. So Bernie, you have a question. I have a quick oh. question here just from one of our, <laughs> no, 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 uh, you get to be next. Uh, so um, the, the writer feels that uh, Brendan noted one way to depoliticize and de-emotionalize a person's vaccine decision is to make it more of a science decision and less a political or emotional one, which we may or may not agree on here. Uh, 
Is the public health community on either a federal or state level making any directed efforts in K through 12 education to create a foundational science education program with the specific intent to change vaccine acceptance? Not that I know of, but I defer to. Uh, yeah, no, I don't. I don't. I don't know uh, uh, of anything specific. Um, I, you know, I guess I would say that, you know, reaching kids is important. But of course, if you're thinking about who's most vulnerable to COVID, right? It's older folks, and so the the messages that they're getting from political elites that's really what I'm going to be focusing on in terms of what's going to drive the partisan divide that we've seen. And it's really important to get those folks out there. Like, do you remember, you all remember at the beginning of the, the vaccine rollout, we had Mike Pence getting the shot in his arm and Mitch McConnell saying he got it, right? We need that again and again and again, right? These, when this bivalent booster rollout happened, we should have had the same thing, right? We should have had all the ex-presidents there in a line saying, we're all getting it, right? We're all old and we're all getting it, right? Um, that would have been wonderful. And we, we've gotten away from that, I think, I think to our detriment. This isn't vaccine specific, but there, there is a movement for more science literacy in K through 12 settings and there's CDC in the classroom, but the work that I'm most excited about is actually the media literacy movement that's gaining a lot of traction in K through 12 settings. Newslet.org, I mean, Brendan's gonna be more expert on this than I am, but there are really good curricula that are just helping kids vet claims. Because I don't, you know, I think of the precious resource that is time in school, and I'm not sure I want them necessarily focused only on vaccine science, right? Like, I want them vetting all health claims. And so I, I am encouraged by, by these movements. They're really movements, I would say. You have the floor. Oh, did you have Bernie. Yes. I don't know you, <laughs> but I feel like, please, go take it away. <laughs> So first of all, I want to say I haven't ignored all the terrific points you made about, you know, an inability to understand the scientific method or feelings first or all these. But I have to when you when Uncle Brendan was talking about uh, vaccine eff effectiveness, it reminded me of my biggest pet peeve during this whole crisis. And that is that every time I looked on the front page of the New York Times or the Washington Post or even went to the CDC website, I would get number of new infections, number of deaths, and I never saw it broken out into number of new deaths of people vaccinated and number of new deaths by people unvaccinated. And I'm just imagining that if that table had been there right from the beginning, whether we might have had a much more effective messaging. I couldn't, I couldn't understand it. I couldn't believe how frustrating it was to see that this was never broken out. Now, every now and then, you'd get a political leader saying, oh, but if you get vaccinated, you're 19 times less likely to be dead. Or it, but that is only if you're over 65 and you're not fat. Right? There, was always, there were always these various ways of squeezing the evidence, which the simple fact is that the level of people who died who were unvaccinated was astonishingly higher than the number who were, and that was never communicated on the front page of the New York Times every day. Why? Tom's got an answer for you. Um, <laughs> well, I, I think there are two things that contributed to it. It may not be the full answer. Uh, we don't have a health system like the UK where everything is run by the NHS and they can do really good operational research in a crisis to identify that. For much of the pandemic, the CDC has not even known what the breakout rate of infection has been. Uh, they struggle to get data from states of the variety you're talking about. And then when they get data, and this is more on the CDC, they are reluctant to release it because traditionally you have a, a relatively academic culture where they do publications and it takes some time for that to come out. So the idea that we'd have a regular timely release, amen. I think that's exactly what we need. 
That is not the system we have in the United States. And the reason why we didn't see the release of that data except in drips and drabs is this issue of they can't get it from the states easily. And many states they don't even have use agreements with. Um, and they are very slow as a general matter, the CDC this is, uh, to release data because of the culture. There are efforts afoot to address both of those problems, but I, I agree it has been a, a significant one. Um, great question and great point. And I, I, I want to, um, if I can, with my comment, bring this back to, it, it, this, is, this is really difficult to communicate. Like, this is, this is, has been one of the central challenges of communication around vaccine effectiveness for two reasons. One is that when you talk about vaccine effectiveness, it's a relative measure. Right, you're, you're talking about you know uh, comparison of infection or death or hospitalization in one group relative to another, and so you hear vaccine effectiveness of 94%. Like that's that's a relative comparison. You're not looking at absolute numbers. What you're talking about is wanting to see the absolute data, the absolute numbers, the absolute number of people infected who are vaccinated versus not, you know, vaccinated, and and that that runs into difficulty. You know, just pulling out the epidemiologist in me. Um, it's it's well it's the one of the challenging principles here is that as the po as the percentage of the population that is vaccinated increases, the proportion of infections, deaths, hospitalizations that are occurring are going to be in people who are vaccinated, right? And so one way to think about this is that if you have 100% of the population vaccinated. 100% of the infections that occur will be in vaccinated people. 100% of the hospitalizations, 100% of the of the deaths that occur will be will be in vaccinated people. And so, you get into these really difficult, complicated sort of epidemiologic principles that the general population doesn't necessarily understand. And so, what you would see in the data is that you know, as vaccination rates increase in a community, a higher and higher proportion of infections, of hospitalizations that are occurring will be in vaccinated people just by, and you know, the WHO has papers and graphs showing this, you know, field evaluation of vaccine effectiveness, I think is one title from 1985 that they republished more recently in the COVID-19 pandemic, showing these curves that as, you know, population um, uh, vaccination increases, uh, more and more people who become infected or die or, or hospitalized will be in vaccinated people because you're talking about proportions and so it's, it's very difficult to communicate proportions and relative measures versus absolute measures, and, and seeing some of this data play out in real time is, is just tough to communicate. Right, but can I just say, you're, you're answering a better question than the one I answered. <laughs> um, I answered a really stupid question. Um, if someone dies in a hospital, you know whether that person was vaccinated or not. That's data that's easy to get and, and rolls up. Now, I'm not sure I understand what you were saying about the public health infrastructure not being there to actually sort of place it somewhere and to place it somewhere and allow it to sort of roll up in the way that it does in the UK or in Israel or something like that. That's a real problem here. I have no question about that. But it's not hard to get data about whether a person who dies is vaccinated or not. Every hospital has it. The question is, who was asking for it and who was aggregating it? Can I, yeah. 10 seconds? If you read any, so I just want to talk about the downside of politicization because I think this draws it out really nicely. Yeah. We're focused on the um, individual level consequences of politicization, the folks who aren't getting vaccinated because of partisan identity and the messages that they are trusting that are associated with it. Mm -hmm. But politicization is also preventing the conversation we need to be having as a country about the broken aspects of our public health culture. There have been heroes at this, in these state agencies, um, like our colleague here, but if you read about the CDC response, in, you know, any, pick any of the 10 books that came out about the first, there are, it's appalling, it's absolutely appalling that like, the CDC is a broken agency, and the FDA did not cover itself in glory either. And, and yet we can't have a conversation about how to fix them because we're caught between um, people who are challenging the very premises of those institutions and people who are saying, trust the silence, science, don't call into question these institutions that we still need to get folks vaccinated. And that's crowded out the kind of reform conversation that we have to be having, right? There's no room, right? You know, the Democrats who are, um, who want to promote vaccination better are fighting a rearguard action to defend those institutions. They're not talking about how to fix them. And that's 
going to, um, we're going to regret that, I think, in the future because mm -hmm. we're not making the changes that desperately need to be made. Mm -hmm. I just want to also follow up on your comment and say that um, the data streams are broken and the reporting of data is a mess um, nationally. And so you're absolutely right. We should be able to easily connect vaccination status to somebody's death or hospitalization. Um, CDC doesn't necessarily have that data, right? Because the data flows, for example, from the hospitals to the states up to the federal government. And there are, um, in each state, for example, there's laws and regulations around the ability to report certain data up to the federal government, right? We, we live in a federalist you know, uh, um, nation. And so, you know, this, this has been an issue with like New Hampshire's vaccination data that we've reported up to the CDC. It's been de-identified, right? And so there's not a way to for the federal government to necessarily connect vaccination status to death records. Um, and, and so it's a patchwork of data systems all over the country, even throughout the federal, you know, system. And there's a huge recognition of the need to remedy this, huge amounts of um, money that are needed to modernize the data systems, something called the Data Modernization Initiative, the DMI, um, if, you, if you Google it, you know, there's lots of money going towards trying to remedy this problem. Oh, yeah, yeah, I yeah. yeah. Um, I am not hugely, I, I am an optimist by nature. I'm not hugely optimistic about the data stream piece. So I am, again, a Medicaid researcher by background, which is federalist. The federal government has spent hundreds upon hundreds of millions of dollars trying to pool all of the Medicaid data across the country. It's a program called TMSIS. It's been slow, the data are bad, and they're lagged. So without some teeth, back to carrots are nice, but like this is not, this is not going to change unless there is like a very heavy hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You had a question. Um, thank you so much for this conversation, and uh, um, uh, I would like to ask a question, if we add to Uncle Brandon, but this is a black, <laughs> uh, this is a black Uncle Brandon, uh, without uh, insurance, without doctor, without um, uh, cousin with PhD, right? And we have access to YouTube and bloggers who are talking about um, and of course, trauma, right? About uh, not trusting government because we um, <clears throat> uh, tried the uh, vaccines on black population before. So, what you are going to do with that kind of uh, how to say that? Well, the, 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 that people, how you can explain it? And plus, there is no stick because that person probably work as a part time uh, employee, and you cannot um, ask him to get a vaccine. So, you get them to the National Association. I'm so sorry, I'm forgetting the exact name, but there's a wonderful group of black physicians who did their own vetting of all of the data of the vaccines. You get them to that messenger, right? I don't talk to that Uncle Brendan. I say, that's the right messenger. So I, this is back to this un Uncle Brendan's point, that we need messengers of all types from all communities, right? And then there are the access issues with getting there and stuff. But again, I don't think there's the right evidence-based message for everybody. I think it's getting them to the messenger. And, and there is a right messenger for this person. It is amazing the people who stood up to become community communicators all across this country. So the only thing I wanted to add to this is we had these plans in place. Um, these plans existed uh, in terms of pandemic influenza. If you looked at Operation Warp Speed and what they funded states to do, they funded just distribution. So it stopped at the point. Like the strategies around community engagement, having specific messengers. In most states, there was no money for that. And it did not happen before they rolled them out. And we've paid the price for that. Um, and it's not because we didn't know we needed to do it. It just wasn't funded in most states. Um, and, and again, there was a fair amount of research being released at the time. Where are these plans? Where are states putting out their community-specific uh, strategies or engagement plans to roll out vaccines to vulnerable groups, and it just simply wasn't there. And yet uptake was like 90% in 
in the early parts, right? It was more of a like a, a slow roll, you know, and then you needed it. So yeah. So I guess I just want. So we do a lot of work. To, um, trying to think about how we uh, um, reach out to more vulnerable populations, and particularly um, the moment we're working on projects that relate to Spanish-speaking and Chinese-speaking populations. Um, so it's not exactly the same, Uncle Brendan. But um, I think the principle of what you're saying is, how do we reach people who might not have access to sort of different kinds of science resources, people resources, health resources, financial resources, all those things. And you know, the work we're doing, and we're doing it with um, at all levels. So we're talking to people who are at public health agencies. Um, we're talking to people who are Chinese speakers and Spanish speakers themselves, their family members who help them navigate, maybe um, folks who are, um, uh, don't have limited English proficiency themselves, but then have family members who do. And the critical piece that we're also talking to is the community-based organization partners. Um, and these are the critical, I mean, I hope you back me up on this, because the, the agencies that I've talked to across the, state, across the United States just when you say like, okay, how are you reaching them? Like, well, we don't even have their trust, but we have a network of CBOs or community-based organizations and they have the trust. And so it has to go down. And when we think about our public health infrastructure, we have to think about things that are not just like, don't end at the end of the, of the building that we call the state or the local public health agency. They are embedded in the community. They have trusted partners who really do know that person and might figure out like, well, how can we get that person into a place where they might sort of have a safe space to make that decision, where information can come to them that's meaningful, that's in their language, that reflects their cultural values, all of those pieces, and there are so many community partners, and that's another piece that we just don't take account of when we're trying to think about pandemic preparedness and planning, is that you know, the, the system that we have that we call a government system, it doesn't work without those partners. They are absolutely essential. So we think about planning, they need to be part of that table from the beginning, and their voices need to be right there. And they need money. Yeah. Yes, and they need a way to actually what? get it without really complicated oh. bureaucracy. Okay, well, um, we're nearing the end, but before we, as a closing, I'd just sort of like a one-liner from each of you and what you think is the most important and impactful lever that we have. I'll use my last comment to 100% echo what you just said, which is, um, you know, public health is not just about a government agency. Public health involves all of us, our community, the public, the community organizations, and, and we really need to leverage, build up and leverage um, those partnerships to a much greater extent um, now and going forward. Okay, Lindsay. I'm going with incentives. Oh, you're a softy. No, I'm a health <laughs> economist by training. I would be, I, you'd have to take away my degree if I didn't. I'll reiterate my point from before and say both. If yeah. we have incentives that community organizations are working towards, right, mm -hmm. then we're aligning, right, the, the, the networks of trust with the incentives that help drive behavior. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, we have the experience of this pandemic. Um, what I worry about the most on the global level is how the conversation about what we should invest in is largely the same stuff we were investing in before this pandemic. Mm -hmm. So the effort is how do we develop a vaccine even faster, even though we developed this one in 326 days from the publication of the genetic sequence? Or how can we invest in the same pandemic preparedness metrics we invested in before? And what I hope we do is we, we see uh, the lessons that emerge from this pandemic in guiding what we should do differently next time and really take to heart those lessons. Because if we think it was about uh, not getting a vaccine soon enough, we weren't paying attention. Mm -hmm. No, no, I actually, I mean, the idea that this was like a miracle of the vaccine actually coming when it did, somehow that headline never really made it. Um, and I think what, one thing that, you know, building off of exactly what you said is when we think about pandemic preparedness, I wanna think about all the pieces that sort of need to be in place to make that effective. Um, and that means not just funding the same old things, but thinking about our partners, thinking about the communication infrastructure. I talked to so many public health agencies and they're like, well, our communications person is part-time here on Tuesdays when the moon is full, so can you get back to me? Like, what, how is that possible? The main spokesperson, the main megaphone is only there on Tuesdays when the moon is full. So how do we have a system and how do we connect federal and state and local levels? And how are we actually funding the local levels? I also talked to a whole bunch of agencies that were like, we don't have a local public health agency. Like, okay, well there are some really big fundamental issues and if we don't begin to address those really systematically, the other part of this conversation is really, really hard. 
And by the way, we also need to really think about the politicization that you're talking about, which is happening not just at the, at the public health level, but really is happening, and giving appropriate jurisdiction to public health agencies so they can say things that are not just sort of a, the mouthpiece of the politics, which is the other piece that's happening. So all of these pieces need to go into place. We have a huge agenda. This is just the beginning. All right. <laughs> well, thank you very much, all of you, for coming. <laughs>